and welcome to Community Cooking with Cardinals High School Cafe. Uh, today we are really, really happy to have with us Shannon Sterling from Albion Hills Community Farm. Um, we have recently partnered with well, Shannon, but mainly Albion Hills Community Farm because of our Farm to Cafeteria program this year, which is very exciting for our school. And now we have the face of our local farmer. So we've talked a lot about local food on this show, but now we have the face of our like, local farmer, and that is you, <laughs> Shannon Sterling. Um, so tell me, let's just start from the beginning. How did you get involved in, in farming? Um, well, I got in far involved in farming when I first moved out on my own. Um, I just remember getting a job to get money, to give it to somebody else, to give it to somebody else, to give it to somebody else, to get food, and it just felt like all, everything that sustained me and supported me, food, everything was so disconnected. And I just felt like a lot of the problems in our world come from that disconnection. So I wanted to be more connected with where my food came from, um, and also how to build houses, like where my shelter came from. And so I just started doing internships. I did natural building internships, and I did farming internships, and I pursued natural health. So. I figured if I could be my own doctor, grow my own food, build my own house, um, that I'd be better off than having a big fancy diploma. Not that there's anything wrong with academic right. institutions, but yeah. I just was had a DIY kind of attitude to it, towards it. Um, and then after interning on the first farm that I was at, I just absolutely fell in love. Um, it's uh, they say farming's kind of addictive. You kind of mm -hmm. just start and you just you know you watch things grow and and you just absolutely fall in love. You just can't not do it. I mm -hmm. can't imagine you know. February, March rolling around and not starting to think about starting seeds and um, growing yeah. a garden. So it's just something um, that I'm absolutely passionate about. I just love it. Um, and so yeah, I just kept pursuing it and then just followed followed that and found myself on any farm I could go to, any farm I could be at, I just wanted to be farming and learning about growing food. That's so, amazing. Yeah. And what, talk to me about how you learned about habitat, like uh, building your own... Oh, I went to um, Eco Village down in Missouri and did a straw bale building internship for a little while um, and uh, volunteered with um, Harvest Homes for a while and just uh, again... And what is Harvest Homes like? Um, I that was a, give me the a natural building co oh, okay. company. I think they've now, they're called Evolved Builders, but just pursued natural building um, and just wanted to learn about you know, how to build shelter in a way that was not toxic to the environment, so pursuing that as well. And okay. I went to um, natural building um, colloquiums and events uh, in Portland and upstate New York, and again, just any chance that I had to learn about it, I just wanted to learn about it. So. Yeah, it's, it sounds like you're really yeah. walking the sustainable walk, not Absolutely. just talking the talk, and yeah. that's so amazing, and I know that you've come in. Uh, since this partnership, which has been so great for us because we do have posters of your face around the school <laughs> holding a big bushel of, of um, parsnip parsnips. <laughs> yes, there are parsnips, and we had our first actual salad bar. One of the things we're doing this year, in, in, as a part of our Farm to Cafeteria grant, is letting having a salad bar where students have access to starting with three but hopefully ending with five local vegetables That's fabulous. Uh, when they go into the cafeteria so they look around you know they see the pizza and the fries not to say that cafeteria food is all necessarily <laughs> pizza and fries but it is one of the options I know they use whole grain crust and stuff but as well they can now see the salad bar which is great because we've done our first one with your local veg mm -hmm. we did a white heirloom beet salad oh, we amazing. did yeah kale chips um, it was something that was really phenomenal, and a lot of students did choose it as an option. So, um, but what really helped was your energy when you came in to talk to the students and actually drop off the vegetables. Because a lot of times this semester, with or this and this season, we're talking about with people about things that sort of that disconnect that you had mentioned prior to. Mm -hmm. So. You know, in terms of where your food comes from, students don't tend to have to think about that very mm -hmm. often. But right now with the resurgence of local, I'd say it's been quite a, a while with the resurgence, it's nice to see something that's getting straight into the schools and being able to affect them. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And I always think it's interesting when, um, you know, you ask kids where food comes from and most of them say the grocery store. And I'm so proud that when I ask my son where food comes from, he says the garden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that we really need to get people thinking about where that food comes from that we're putting in our bodies for sure. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the CSA and, and what that is and the community farm because start at the beginning in case viewers may not know. Absolutely. So um, one of the main ways we distribute our vegetables is through something called a CSA or Community Supported Agriculture. So a lot of people you say 
what does CSA stand for? And most people say Canada Standards Association. <laughs> um, but in our world, CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. So it's a model of farming that actually started back in the 80s in the States. And it was a lot of farmers who spent all their time and energy planning and putting their resources and their time, blood, sweat, and tears into growing food for people, and then would have to take it to market. And it may or may not sell. So it was a little bit precarious, not a, not a great situation for them. Um, and so they went to their regular customers and they said, hey, how about we have a partnership and you support us and we support you and we work together. So they designed a model where um, customers will purchase a share in advance of the season. So our members are signing up now for 2017, which for most people sounds a little crazy to buy your vegetables, you know, six months in advance. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, the reality of supporting local food is realizing that Growing food takes planning, and it takes time, and it takes that, that advanced planning that we need. So by doing that, it's a real amazing way to be able to support local food, is thinking in November, you know, what am I eating next summer? And mm -hmm. who, where is that coming from? Um, because th the farmers that grow that food need to start thinking about that right now. We do all our crop planning, our seed purchasing, all these step planning, our staff for next year, all happens through the winter months. Mm -hmm. So to be able to have that financial support so we can do that is crucial to us. So the CSA program is a great way for customers to support us and also to get connected with where their food and where it's coming from. So we encourage our CSA members to come up to the farm, to be involved, we have events, we have workshops, all different kinds of ways they can get involved. We also send out a newsletter every week um, with their CSA share, they get a newsletter that uh, that talks about stories from the farm, recipes, tells them what celeriac is and what you're mm -hmm. going to do with yeah. it. Yeah. So um, just a really nice way for people to feel connected. And, and people do. Our members um, who have been there since I started, you know, are always coming back and they feel like it's their farm. So they really feel connected to where their food's coming from. They can come out and see the beautiful nature that they're protecting by buying sustainable food that's not sprayed with chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really, really nice for people to have that connection to the land and the place and the people where their food is coming from. Um, so yeah, the CSA is a great model. And like I said, it's also that really crucial piece of supporting us by making that commitment. Um, and that way, too, um, it's sort of a risk and reward situation. So if we get bumper crop of tomatoes, you get a bumper crop of tomatoes. If we get a blight, people understand. They realize mm -hmm. that weather affects it. And so we have that relationship to nature and to weather and to the things that affect the production of our food. Yeah, absolutely. So, and yeah. I, I think that really that idea of sustainability does go hand in hand with forethought. You're, you know, the, the way that you practice sustainability is to plan for what you need in a way that you're not sort of reaping what we don't have, yeah, right? And absolutely. so, absolutely. Yeah. And people learn about eating seasonally. They learn about what's in season mm -hmm. and, and how to use those things. Um, and I really think it's better for our bodies that way. It also allows us to give people a really good deal. Um, you know, for $30 a week, you get a lot of vegetables that if you went to the grocery store and bought would cost a lot more money mm -hmm. um, if you were buying them all organically. Um, so in that way, it's a really good value because mm -hmm. we can be efficient about it. We can produce exactly what we need. So um, it's, it's nice to be able to give people a big bounty of vegetables. And they also get um, introduced to things that they might not buy in the grocery store. Sometimes yeah. you go to the grocery store and you get stuck in that rut of always buying the same things. Whereas with the CSA, it's sort of, we do have an option where we have a swap box. So if there's something that you really don't like, you can swap it out for something else. Um, but really, it's sort of uh, every week, you just get this big box. And some of our, our members say it's like Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, because every week, it's like they don't know what they're getting. It's like, surprise, what's in the box this week? And there's some regular staples kind of thing. We always have salad. We always have um, kale, things like that that are pretty pretty mm -hmm. standard in the box, um, but then we switch things up so there's something new every week. So that's a nice thing too. So it's kind of keeps things fresh and new and exciting for people. Um, and they really look forward to things too. Like they know when cucumber season or tomato season's coming, so they get excited about that stuff too. Um, and every year I usually try and pick a few new varieties of something to grow. Um, and we also grow such a variety. We grow 50 different crops, over 200 different varieties. So, you know, people may not have seen purple beans before or purple carrots or purple peppers. <laughs> a lot of the purple. Yeah. Um, people love that stuff. But we always try and do, grow something new and exciting. We have edible flowers. Um, we encourage people to come out to the farm and pick peas or cherry tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And people love that a lot with their kids. They'll bring their kids out and get their kids involved. And so they're seeing where their food is coming from. And people love that a lot, too. Yeah. And, so. you know, I, I know just speaking from 
I'm, you know, a foodie's perspective, I love to cook. It is like Christmas when you, you know, some people, which is great that you have recipes and cards and information on the food that they might not know, are a little leery if they don't have a recipe. But mm -hmm. uh, other people are love, I just know foodies, just love the idea that uh, my, my brother-in-law calls it, um, oh, this, the last chance soup or whatever. Like when you look in the fridge and you know it's got to go, so this is the <laughs> last chance, whatever you do. Not yeah. to say, but that's the idea is that you take what you have and you create with it, which is so Absolutely. fun, I think, about the CSA, that fun element there. And also, so um, in terms of how it works, you would have to pick up the CSA at the farm most, uh, for most points, or there's certain we hubs? Have, we have hubs, so we do have a drop-off in Bolton at mm -hmm. the exchange in Bolton, so we work with them. They also run a food bank, so if there's anything left over at the end, it goes to the food bank as well. So that's yes. a really nice partnership. Yeah. We work with them. Um, so there's a pickup there. We have a pickup at the farm, um, and we also have done corporate pickups before. So there's some places um, that actually have... Um, have promoted it through their staff mm -hmm. and so we'll show up and you know 15 of the staff members have bought a share and we'll show up with a drop off so if um, you know say you have a location a place of work um, you want your employers to to encourage your employees to be healthy and eat well because we know that healthy employees are more efficient more effective um, so if you're interested in something like that we can absolutely arrange something in a place of work or a church or any community that you can get 10 or 15 shares that you're interested in having us do a drop off Absolutely, please contact us and let us know because we're upping our amount of shares in 2017. So we're definitely looking for more opportunities to bring shares to places of work or, or community groups or anywhere that you can sell 10 or 15 shares that you might know of people. We could potentially do a delivery right in your neighborhood. Fantastic. So, well, hopefully yeah. you'll see the information here on screen and be able to, to contact. And, and that's fantastic. Um, so you are going to stick around with us, and actually Absolutely. we have some of your harvested vegetables, mm -hmm. and we're going to have a bit of a cook-off, and you'll Yay. be the judge of that. But before we go, we're going to do our little mirepoix moment, and that mm -hmm. just gives us a chance to get to know a little bit about the community guests. Sure. Um, favorite pantry item. So it sounds like you are so big with uh, fruits <laughs> and vegetables. I'm really interested to know Ooh. yours. Uh, favorite pantry, pantry item. Well, I actually just finally cleaned up my pantry. It was like I was waiting to do it all summer. <laughs> so my first day that I didn't have to do anything, it was like, I'm cleaning my pantry. Um, but I would have to say uh, Tulsi basil. It's something that comes from the farm. We dry it. Um, we have it fresh in the summer, which is amazing, and I love it. Um, but then we dry it, and I have it to use through, um, as a spice as well as a tea throughout the season and it's an adrenal adaptogen so it's an amazing balancing herb it's fresh it's incredible they tease me at the farm it's my spirit plant because i plant oh, so much of it seriously? but i just feel now like I everybody it's it. also it's also known as holy basil okay um so it's a totally sacred plant it's absolutely mm -hmm. amazing it's an incredible medicine i'm like everybody needs to know about tulsi basil <laughs> okay it is so, definitely can i plant it like yeah. where would i buy it and jeff it's going in my garden absolutely, absolutely. i think next we'll definitely spring. have some okay. seedlings at our plant sale as well in the spring so. I'll, i'm there i am yeah. there that is so Sold, sold. Okay, favorite restaurant? Um, I would have to say Rustic in Orangeville. It's a little, I feel like I've not it, yeah. many. Yeah, oh, good. Yeah, you have yeah, heard yeah. Of it. I thought it was like a secret. I was like, how do they, I, I, everybody needs to know about yeah. this place. It's right downtown Orangeville. We actually went there for my birthday this year, and it was over the top incredible. I couldn't have imagined a more perfect dinner. It was absolutely lovely. They're great supporters of local foods. So they have a lot of local stuff on the menu. Um, and I had a like mixed drink with a popsicle. It was wow, okay. <laughs> super exciting. Oh my goodness, we'll have to check that out. Favorite grocery store? Um, I gotta say, I'm not the biggest fan of groceries. Not that I, you know, I do shop, I, I kind of spread it around, go to different ones at different times, but I love the farmer's market. I can't help it. Okay, I, I'm Perfect. a farmer's market and girl. I, I should, I should <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm learning as I go. I gotta start revamping these questions yeah. for people because uh, it's always different. And what about your favorite splurge item? <sighs> I would probably say organic, um, I, just in general, organic fruits, um, because fruit is one thing we don't grow, mm -hmm. and organic fruit can be expensive, but I absolutely think it's imperative, especially things like grapes, like I just won't buy them non-organic. Oh, um, okay. Of course, when I bring home a $15 bag of grapes, my partner looks at me <laughs> like I'm insane. But it's just the, the chemicals that are sprayed on, especially grapes and, you know, sort of the dirty dozen mm -hmm. they talk about. Um, so yeah, d okay. organic organic citrus fruit, everyone's on And I feel like that's a splurge in more than just a financial way for me when I buy citrus fruit, because it's coming from so far away. So it's every once in a while, like I, 
I kind of had a thing where I only bought oranges at Christmas. They were like Christmas mm -hmm. oranges at a point in time. Now maybe I've slid with that a little, but um, yeah. Yeah, well, that makes fruit. sense. I used to get an orange in my stocking when I was yeah, little. Yeah, it just <laughs> so, reminds me you know, of that. Yeah, so. absolutely. Wow. Yeah. And finally then, if you had only to pick one type of food for the rest of your life, what would it be? I think I would have to say pears. I love pears. They are so good. Oh, They're incredible wow. for your lungs. They're really, um, really great food. and. Amazing. And you, you can, can do grow so them many things in with Ontario, them. so you that's great. You can go great. sweet with them. You can go savory. Yeah. They're so versatile. So And they can be local, which is really, really Absolutely. good. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. That's amazing. Well, yeah. thank you so much. Oh, I'm no looking problem. forward My to pleasure. the cook-off. Hopefully, it won't be too hard on the kids as they cook yeah. their vegetables. Oh, so I'm totally So stick around, excited. and we'll see you in a few minutes. Hi. Welcome back to Community Cooking with Cardinals High School Cafe. We have Dylan and Finley here, and uh, you guys are gonna cook for us today, have a little friendly cooking competition. What are you guys yeah. cooking? Uh, a cheesy bacon calzone. Ooh. Thing. Well, my version of it anyways. Uh-huh. Okay, now I am making a nice salad with um, some Swiss, Swiss, Swiss. Swiss chard? Swiss chard, yes, that's Excellent. what it's called. Swiss chard, kale, um, some chicken breast, and then some seasoning to go with it with the Swiss chard and kale. Oh, okay. And then I'm going to throw it all in the salad. Oh, sounds delicious. Yep. So you're going to check it out. And uh, where is this uh, kale coming from? Uh, from uh, your farm, actually. Looks familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. It yeah, looks familiar. Yeah, from your farm. So it's nice to actually oh. get used to it. Oh, it looks good. <laughs> so let's okay. put in for that simmer. All right. Did you grind the flour for this uh, calzone? No, <laughs> no not, but I made the dough. There yet? I made the dough. Okay, well, so. maybe I'll have to come into the school sometime with my flour mill. We can oh, grind some so fresh cool. flour. Absolutely, I'd love to uh, to get into growing grains eventually too at the farm. We've got quite a bit of acreage, and I think it'd be really neat to be able to grow some of our own um, flour grains and make a little uh, cob oven. We could do some, make some bread and that homegrown bread millet. Delicious. Yeah. So that's uh, Sure smells good. Hope so. <laughs> does it smell as good as it tastes so? That's a question. <laughs> that's a question. So what's your guys' favorite thing to cook? Uh um, eesh, that's a good question. I would just say pizza. Yeah. Because it's uh, simpler to make. Yeah. <laughs> so. You don't gotta wrap it up? No. <laughs> not not that much, no. Um I don't know what it is, but I just really like eggs for some reason. Eggs? Eggs, That's a good one. I think it's a, a nice ingredient to use for a dozen of re recipes, countless recipes. Absolutely. And it adds a really nice taste to whatever you're making. And a great, okay. great source of protein without the footprint of maybe um, some uh, other proteins. Yes, it's great all around, really. Cool. So I added some butter to the chicken to give the chicken a nice glaze to it and uh -huh. that buttery flavor. Uh -huh. And then this is the Swiss chard on the side. Oh, lovely. And then I'm going to add this with the kale when it's mm -hmm. ready. Nice. I can't wait to taste this. We grow a lot <laughs> yeah. of chard at the farm, so oh, you do? I just have to keep the deer off of it. <laughs> <laughs> so then what wildlife do you have near the farm then? Oh, we have all kinds of wildlife. And uh, as much as I love the wildlife, we're constantly trying to keep them off our crops. This year was especially bad with the drought because it was so dry. Right. Um, anything that was irrigated was, uh, you know, very um, uh, alluring to uh, animals. Right. So, um, and putting in deer fences can be costly. So we do a lot of different alternatives. We tried fishing line this year, but that was a bit of a tangle, <laughs> so to speak. But um, yeah, we're, we're looking at different options. Um, but uh, pest control is something we deal with a lot. But we've got, it's beautiful. There's herons that fly overhead all the time. Um, we've got uh, deer, uh, turtles. I mean, just about any wildlife. We actually had a cougar sighting. Um, on, uh, we're right on Albion Hills Conservation Area, and there's a couple young boys who were um, biking and said they heard something behind them and looked back and there was a cougar running alongside the trail. So, and there's even been bear sightings in Caledon now, which is, that's you know, something kind of crazy. But um, yeah, there used to be cougars in the area back in the 60s, but then a lot of them became extinct, so. Oh, well then that's good that they're coming back. Yeah, then. yeah, I think it's probably a good thing, even though, you know, 
Scary. Might want to go hiking with a buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, since you have the drought, like, what are some ways that you deal? Um, well, we're really lucky. We do have irrigation. We have a drip irrigation system, right. which is super efficient. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a bit of an investment, but I think it's really paid off. So we're one of the lucky ones. Um, a lot of farms this year, people I know who farm, where their irrigation ponds and things were running dry, and we've got a well that we irrigate off of that we're really lucky to have. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, a plus. Um, but, uh, I mean, we're also careful with our water. We do a lot of mulching to keep moisture in the soil. Right. Um, and a big part of it for us this season, which is the heat, is having people work out there. We work with a lot of volunteers. And i got to say, you don't get quite as many volunteers when it's 40 degrees out. No, um, so that, that was a bit tough. But, yeah, we're really lucky that we have the irrigation. And it makes you really value that, you know, really right. understand how much weather can affect um, food production, especially local food production. Well, I mean, all food production, wherever you're located. But, yeah, so. So then uh, what kind of vegetables then do you grow? Um, we grow all kinds of things. We grow about 50 different vegetables, 200 different varieties. Um, so everything from arugula to zucchini and everything in between, beans, peas, right. tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, eggplant, fennel, celeriac, kohlrabi, um, you name it, we pretty much grow it. We don't obviously grow tropical things and we don't grow a lot of fruit. Um, it's tricky for us to do a lot of perennials um, right. because we don't own the property. We try and put in as many perennials as we can when we get things donated. Um, but it's really tricky for us to to do, put too much um, financial um, input into into it when we don't own the property when we're right. leasing it. So that's a bit tricky. But we do have a perennial bed that's just donated herbs and things that we've slowly been putting in a little bit of rhubarb, some raspberries, things like that. Oh, that's good. So um, so it's nice to get a mix of those things. And sometimes we bring in fruit to our market from other other farms, local farms. Right. So in that way, we also sort of work as a food hub that we bring in other local products. And we'd like to expand that more. So. Uh, sounds great. So then uh, what's your favorite thing to grow? Oh, gosh. So that's, a, that's such a tricky one. I love growing every, just watching plants. I mean, eggplant is really fun. The flowers on eggplant are just beautiful. Right. Um, cabbage is really fun because it's just, you know, these big, beautiful heads. Um, cucumbers. I have one variety of cucumber called Summer Dance. It's an English cucumber, and it's got to be one of my favorites. Right. Um, I never grew English cucumbers or before because generally English cucumbers are grown in greenhouses, not in a field. I would always grow field um, uh, cucumbers because, you know, we're growing in a field. We didn't have a greenhouse. And then everybody kept bugging me to grow English cucumbers. Usually you trellis them to get them real nice and straight and all that stuff. Right. And they kept bugging me saying, you know, we want English cucumbers. And so I was just like, okay, I'll, I'll try it. And uh, I just picked a variety. I was like, oh, summer dance. That sounds nice. <laughs> and I picked it. And it's been so amazingly productive. It is the sweetest, most amazing tasting cucumber I've ever had. Um, really? So, yeah, that's one of my favorites is, is definitely cucumber is really fun. Um, tomatoes are great when you get a dry year because then <laughs> you get beautiful tomatoes and you don't get blight. So that's right. really fun and they're always really, really productive. But, yeah, it's hard to pick a favorite. I mean, right. just growing everything in general is, you know. So then based off what you said, then tomatoes would be the easiest thing to grow then? Oh, opinion? no, no. Tomatoes are not easy, but if you get a dry year, um, so, so tomatoes get something called blight. So if you get rain on their leaves or you get moisture on the leaves, um, it can spread this disease called blight and it's moisture really exacerbates it. So when we get a drought year, um, right. we're irrigating from below. So our tomatoes are still getting watered, but they're not getting moisture on their leaves. And so they do really well. Right. Um, the year before last, we definitely didn't have a dry year. We had moisture. It wasn't overly wet, but it was definitely wet. And we lost 750 tomato plants. And the blight spread, it was the fastest spreading blight I've ever seen. Um, I literally saw it on a, a Tuesday night, and the Wednesdays are harvest day. We were harvesting all day. I went home Tuesday night, boiled up a bunch of horsetail tea, right. um, which is something we spray for blight because it combats um, conditions of dampness um, in the body as well as in the field. So we, we boil up this horsetail. It's a, a wild local herb I har harvest. We boil it up and do a tea and spray that. Well, I boiled it up Tuesday night, went back to the farm on Wednesday, was harvesting all day, went out to the field um, in the evening about 7 o'clock to spray the tea, and the plants had literally gone from having a few spots to being totally dead. 
it was it was devastating i just cried because it was just i mean but that's farming i mean and and we you know sent a letter to the csa members letting them know and they were so supportive and understanding it's almost you know they were they were really really great about it so right. that's one of the amazing things about csa is that you have that support and people understand um but we also you know keep trying to grow tomatoes um because there was some concern some people didn't want us to continue growing tomatoes um on our, our organizing committee that wants to grow tomatoes the next year. And I said, well, if we don't grow tomatoes because of blight, and we don't grow eggplant because of Colorado potato bug, and we don't grow, you know, arugula because right. of flea beetle, I mean, there could be a reason to not grow everything. But I think we just have to keep trying. And, and then you get a really great tomato year. Like this year was an amazing tomato year because it was dry. Um, so, yeah. Right. Oh, this looks pretty good. <laughs> so this is just a, um, a salad with the, like I said, this was chard and the kale. Okay, like a warm salad. Yeah, and I mixed it with some Beautiful. balsamic uh, vinegar, some Ooh. organo, and black pepper. Lovely. Maple syrup. Ooh. Um, I also put some onions in there. Um, did not put vinegar. I was going to, but I <laughs> I changed it to the balsamic because I figured that'd be a lot nicer. And then I also added some salt and a little bit of vegetable oil. Nice. That's gonna yeah, be this looks nice like a feast. Flavor. Yeah, so I'm just plating it now with the kale in it. And you can also see that uh, there's kale in it with the onion, cheese, ah. and the bacon all in the dough itself. So, <laughs> yeah, who knows? Hopefully it tastes good. <laughs> Is the kale supposed to make you feel better about the cheese and the bacon? <laughs> I'm hoping so. <laughs> Yeah, it's not too it's, much, it's a nice so. balanced dish. The the healthy kale and the the I think so. the um what is the luxury or the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The the glut of the bacon and the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> we all need a little of that in our lives too, right? Just a little bit, you know? A little <laughs> bit of everything. Well it looks wonderful. So should I go ahead and uh, try these dishes? Where do I um, start? Let's see here. I need about twenty seconds. <laughs> I'll be over here eating eating this calzone. <laughs> I'll try and save some room. <laughs> All right. Mmm. It's so good. <laughs> Ready over here? Um, just about. I should need oh. uh, the Swiss chard. I guess I'll have some more calzone. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get some of that kale in there. <laughs> <laughs> the healthy stuff? Yeah. It's almost considered cheating that bacon, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Can you try this one now. Yep. Here you Ready? Go. Here. I'm going straight for the chart. I can't help it. Mmm. <laughs> it's delicious. Mmm. All right, so now I have to make a decision. Hard decisions. I got to say, that charred salad is pretty darn good. I think <laughs> I'm going to have to go with this one. As delicious as that is, if I wanted, you know, um, a greasy late night stack, I think I'd be all over this. But that charred salad was absolutely spectacular. How so was the I meat think meat? The, the meat is delicious as well. Yeah, yeah, but that char just totally took it, I gotta yeah. say. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, and uh, we'll see you again next time.